Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 199. This episode is with the fantastic Todd Stashwick. I originally was introduced to Todd by previous guest Yuri Lowenthal, and I'm so excited to have him on the show. In this episode, we talk about him growing up in Chicago, his custom Stashwick gaming table, performing with Second City, auditioning for SNL, reigniting his love of Dungeons and Dragons, Deacon's character arc on 12 Monkeys, what it was like to see his Star Trek uniform on display at the Grauman's Chinese Theater, and so much more. Be sure to check him out as Captain Liam Shaw in Star Trek Picard Season 3, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Spoiler alert, he's great in it. But before you do that, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 199, with Todd Stashwick. Theme song time. going busy is the day yeah it's good it's good look I'm, I'm fortunate to be busy do you like being busy or are you good with free time both yeah Why not both Why yeah not both? <laughs> that sounds too healthy for me todd no i i i uh <laughs> look i guess it's one of those like uh, if i'm uh, i'll enjoy my free time and i will i will relish in that and at a certain point i want to get back to being busy and then i'll be busy and i'll go okay well i look forward to uh at a certain point having some downtime I feel like I don't I don't do free time very well. I, I like the I like the busy. I like doing stuff all the time. And when I'm not, I get anxious. Well, but even in free time, oh, I mean, are you saying free time like in a hammock si- sipping lemonade? That's time? true. That's true. Depending on what the free time is. Right. Because like I consider prepping a Dungeons and Dragons game a free free time. Oh, gotcha. OK. So I'm still busy. Sure, but I'm sure. filling it with my pursuits as opposed to gotcha. ones assigned to me or, you know, ones that procure income. Okay, okay. I'm down with that. But I, I'll take a hike and a bike ride or a surf anytime. I guess, yeah, defining free time, filling it with stuff that, like, fulfills the spirit, you know, things that are personal for you. Yeah, yeah. agree. Like, but, like, look, I'm also not opposed to a nap. Yeah. <laughs> That's good though. That's good. I so I watched a uh, I watched an interview I think you did on the red carpet lately for Picard. Uh-huh. And you mentioned you're from Chicago. That's where I grew up. Yeah. Right. Uh, what is what is it like growing up in Chicago? I've been for like short stints, but it was always for like an event or like a reason. I have nothing else to compare it to. Fair. So I guess it's like growing up wherever you grow up. Uh I spent the first formative 7 years of my life in the city proper and then in 76 yeah we moved out to the suburbs cool i had a very john hughes there you go uh stranger things without the uh without the demogorgons upbringing (laughs) that you knew of it was bmx bikes and uh and D &D and star wars toys uh yeah very very i had a very hay rides and you know i had a very one would say idyllic uh i got to be a kid for a good long time i think i read somewhere that you also started out as like you wanted to be a graphic artist i was a cartoonist yeah, yeah. I, I was always drawing cartoons for a good long time and i thought that was the direction i was going to go in my life was to draw comic strips cool. um, and then that i just didn't like getting notes on my art (laughs) but i didn't mind getting i didn't mind getting notes as an actor and it was a louder profession and far more social sure yeah so i so and i really enjoyed performing and i was always a kid doing you know elvis impressions for my mom and sure and and playing make-believe in the backyard with my star wars guys and my cousin Mm -hmm. Uh, and then D D was always you know it's role playing and so i some form of performance was always part of my history and always ever present and then around the junior year of high school it 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 turned from art to to acting really do you remember if there was a moment like did D come first or did the uh interest in acting come first 
D and D came first. Yeah, yeah. D and D came first, and I mean, I was always acting, you know, pretending to be Han Solo and whatnot. But of course, but I was never. It wasn't until, like I said, I think my junior year of high school that I was like, you know what, maybe I want to be a professional actor. Yeah. And, and I had finished playing Dungeons and Dragons by, let's see, eighty two or eighty three, I think. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, summer of eighty two, I think. I stopped playing D and D just before high school. Okay. Were you a player or a DM? Both. At yeah. the time, we all were very utilitarian. Sure. Uh, about it, like it was just who wants to run the game and. Yeah, because you had less ongoing campaigns, I think, and we did more like, hey, let's do this part of this module. All right, I'll run it. You do it this week. Okay, yeah, I'll run it. Now I'm drawing a map. I'm creating my own. All right, I'll run that one. It was all, it, it, like, we all took turns DMing and, uh, and or playing, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. What was your class? Well, back in the day, we, we, we were known as fighter. I was multi-class, so I was a fighter magic user. Nice. I was a half-elf fighter magic user. What was his name? Morton Didif. D-I-D-I-F. Yeah. I love it. Have you brought him back in anything yet? Well, I, so, so this, this, uh, this gentleman by the name of Jay Scott, who does, um, he does first edition live stream games with beautiful mini setups. Oh, cool. Uh, invited me to play in his Greyhawk uh, game. And uh, I said, well, if I'm going back to first edition, I want to play the character I played in first edition. So I did bring him back. Cool. How was that? It was great. Yeah. How many sets of dice do you have? I couldn't even tell you. An embarrassing amount. An embarrassing <laughs> amount. Yeah. I'm not proud of it, but it's an embarrassing <laughs> amount. Yeah. Do you do you pick by color? Do you or do you go like I, I like to do? Oh, this character is this. So I got to get dice for that. Yeah, character. It's, it's more it's more dice for a specific adventure because I do DM mm -hmm. more than I play. Sure. And so uh, it's more dice for a specific adventure. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I respect that. Speaking of, actually, how many iterations did it take to get to the final version of the Stashwick table? Because it is a work of art. I'm seated at it right now. Oh um, my well, goodness! The, it, it, it is. That? It is a. Um, it's based off the uh, the Harbinger, which is. Oh yeah. The flagship table of the Weather Dragon, and I looked at that, and I also looked at my nerd lair and, and talking with Mike. I was like, "Yeah, I love the Harbinger. It's just, it's a beast, and it could not yeah. fit in my nerd lair." <laughs> sure. And he said, "Well, what if we design something to your specifications?" that could fit in your nerd lair uh and we kind of went from there so uh things that i wanted to make sure that i had were like like the fire pits so cool and then there's uh there's the lit up cubbies and then this is a, a topper that comes off and um underneath it is the uh, mini vault what um and so yeah it has a lot of uh doodads and a lot an led lit mini vault and um cup holders and stuff and so a lot of it is based off of his original harbinger design what i really love about it is um it has space for your character sheet oh cool as opposed to a lot of these that are mostly vault and just have like a little lip and you have to pull a side thing out for all of your wares uh -huh. this actually because people like to lean on the table and have their character sheet in front of them and their dice towers and i like that aspect of it in that it's very player focused. Dude, do you ever just sit there and think like kid me would be freaking out right now? You know, if you had told 10 year old Todd that someday he would have a table with his signature on it, I would say, yeah, that totally tracks. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, you were only ever on this road. <laughs> yeah. Destiny. Had plans. Right. I respect the commitment. That's what it's about. I found Yuri taught me that the key to success as any performer. It's uh, you persistence. know, it's fun. <laughs> it's funny. The uh, somebody said, "Do you ever think that you'd be a Starfleet captain?" I'm like, "That's always the goal." Right. Like, <laughs> what else was I yeah, gonna be? <laughs> I was I was pretending to be a Starfleet captain when I was six. So yeah. it, 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 it's it was never out of the question. Sure. <laughs> How did it compare? Because you have dreams as a kid, and now you've lived it. Did it live up to the hype as a child? Or of course, yeah. It did. Of course it did. Yeah. Talk to me. Talk to me. You're sitting there. You're eating blue meat. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I'm eating space meat. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, was, it, it, it was a singular experience. I mean, it was a working with people that are just delightful professionals and super talented. And then on sets that, uh, that are just a playground for you and you and you see all of the panels lit up and i'm sitting in my captain's chair it was just it it it, it met and exceeded all expectation and you're with the guy you're with the original people like there i am that's got to be so trippy to be like you're you're talking to jean-luc picard as a captain as a captain in your captain seat todd the up the upside yeah <laughs> the 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 interesting thing was the character as written um holds high status over them he does not see them as these lofty legends, right? He he is uh, not impressed. Yeah, <laughs> and so uh, so it, it, it in many ways made the scenes that much more fun because he wasn't sycophantish tripping over himself to service these legends. He uh, actually you know tries to take him down a peg or two. I mean, to be fair, you have the coolest name in like history, Captain Liam Shaw. Yeah, it doesn't stink. There's way worse names it could be, <laughs> Captain Shaw. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's there's a music to it. There is. There is. There's a power to it. Yeah. Like you know who you don't mess with? Liam Shaw. You don't mess with Shaw. That's an action hero. I don't disagree. And his and his his knife work. I mean, come on. I wouldn't mess with that. Uh, guy. Superior knife work. Yeah. That's a there's a there's a bit of a wink there to uh to Twelve Monkeys because when my character was introduced on Twelve Monkeys, I was holding a knife and sharpening it, and you would see like part of my uh... face and part of the knife. And that's kind of the same way we introduced uh, Shaw. That's Terry being being clever. <laughs> I love it. Hey, Scav King to uh, Starfleet Captain. The Captain, not, not a not a bad journey. See, I'm only seeing upwards projections. We got a Romulan, yeah. you, where you get to do a nerve pinch. Pretty cool. Look at you, killing it. Yeah, killing it. Living the dream. So you're you're. So I'm tracking this. You got junior year of high school is when you're like, I'm gonna be a professional actor. Yeah. Was Second City like? just there and you're like that's what i'm going to do or was that the goal at the gate well it was you know the goal was uh, how can i become bill murray solid plan that was the goal like like uh, like meatballs ghostbusters stripes saturday night live all i ever wanted to do was be bill murray yeah and so i i literally looked at his trajectory which was all right second city okay well then if i want to be on saturday night live i gotta go to second city so even literally the first day of college i was going to loyola university at the time and there was a second city touring company performing as sort of like freshman week uh, -huh. uh and i went to see that and then a woman by the name of holly wartell came out on stage after the show and she was you know lacing up her shoes or something i said and like 17 year old stashwick because i entered college young nice. uh, 17 year old stashwick just because i'm an october baby sure uh, that'll do it so uh i was like how do you get into second city and she uh <laughs> and she, her advice at the time she's like get a job there like bartending and waiting tables oh. so that you can watch the shows and get the classes and so you're absorbing it and you get to know everybody and you understand the mechanisms of, the, of it yeah. and i tucked that away for four years and like literally the summer i got out of college a buddy of mine, Lou, was working at Second City Northwest, and he helped me get a job uh, tearing tickets at Second City Northwest. Dude. And then that transferred into a job downtown Chicago, of which I started classes at Second City, and then I started classes at Improv Olympic, studying with Del Close. Uh, and uh, it, it all just was uh, going from there. And then I was up for Saturday Night Live in 95, uh, which didn't pan out, but... Uh, but it moved me to New York. I was like, all right, I'm ready. I'm done being in Chicago. I'd spent five years in Chicago. I'm ready to I'm ready to strike out into a bigger a bigger market. What was your SNL audition? Do you remember? This was the mid nineties, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> How all great stories start. Uh, I did a bunch of characters mm -hmm. and then I did impressions. And I think at the time my impressions were very mid nineties. So like my political <laughs> impression was Bob Dole. And I did like I think I did like the MTV music awards or something uh -huh. and so i was like i'm gonna do paul riser and christian slater and keanu reeves and tommy lee jones and eddie vetter and michael stipe and so i just like <laughs> burned through a bunch of impressions in a row like i would have like each character would tee each other up that was my audition yeah how'd you end up on conan so similarly uh, a bunch of the uh guys i toured with and did shows with in in chicago with second city when they left Second City, they went on to be writers for Conan. 
Oh. And, um, and so whenever they were looking for people to be ancillary stable of comedy people, mm -hmm. uh, I was living in New York. And so my buddy Brian Stack would be like uh, throwing me a bone and like, let's put you in here. Let's include you in this. Let's do this. Yeah. So I was for at least two years of my life, I was doing Conan at least once a week. Wow. That's great. Keeping the chops. It was great. And that was my introduction to live television. And it was really cool. And at the same time, I had an improv group that was doing shows out of the Lower East Side of Manhattan. That was Burn Manhattan. That was Burn Manhattan with Kevin Scott and Jay Roderick, John T. Matt Higgins, Kate Walsh. Yeah. Directed by Shira Piven. Dude. Uh, Spencer Caden would jump in. A guy named Andy Newberg would jump in. It was uh, seminal to me. It was very formative. I was in my mid to late 20s and i was you know, doing basement theater in the lower east side of manhattan doing kind of experimental underground improv and it was really uh, a very special time of my life yeah how did it, how did it compare coming from second city with like chicago audiences versus being in you know the theater capital of the globe well well it was different we were doing a different animal and so yeah. second city was second city was very public and very polished and very like I don't want to say corporate, but it was very like, it's a package. So it's like, sure. you're going to do sketch comedy and you're going to, it's very like a produced show. Uh, Burr Manhattan was much more, you know, punk rock. Yeah. It was much more loose and experimental and weird and insane. And yeah. you know, <laughs> we wouldn't take suggestions and we would just improvise <laughs> for over an hour. It was nuts. It was so much fun. Really? Was there a learning curve going from like stage to screen? Yeah, of course there is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, you're used to, trying to hit the back row with your performance as an actor on stage. Mm -hmm. And then when you do, um, when you're working for the screen, and, and especially with hour long drama, the camera's up your nose. So like you raise an eyebrow and it's- A lot. It has it has a lot, yeah, How, a big effect. Do you remember your first film gig? Film or professional on camera gig? Ooh, both. My first professional on camera gig. Well, my first film gig was I was an extra in She's Having a Baby, John Hughes film with Kevin what? Bacon. John Hughes, bringing it back. I'm saying, but cut <laughs> out of the final version. You got at least one. <laughs> yeah. And then um, uh, then I did a, a professional gig that, that got me like my SAG Taft-Hartley. Yeah, there uh, you go. Was uh, I did a, I think it was an Adidas industrial with colbert where we where we were it was like one of those that you a training video that you show uh-huh employees yeah <laughs> and it was uh yeah so it was one of those where we were dressed as employees of like a footlocker and having to explain shoes yeah and that was that was steve and colbert and myself uh and so that was the first time i think i was on camera professionally mm -hmm. uh and no one will see that i can't even imagine there's somebody somewhere <laughs> on some quarter inch tape exists this um, bit of nonsense and then um and then i think the thing that i officially got my sag card for was a show called remember when oh it was about a a radio station in the 30s or 40s mm -hmm. in new york yeah i played a gangster was it different than you expected well i had been doing conan i think by that point uh-huh which is different than conan is much more like doing theater Okay. Because it was comedy sketches and whatnot. Sure. But doing like closed set stuff where you have to hit your mark and it's, you know, and you do it again and again and again and again and again. Now we're going to turn the camera around and again, do it again and again and again and again. Like it's a slower process. It's a lot more waiting than doing. Did you find that it still interested you just as much? Because when you, it, there's a difference between wanting to do something and having a dream of doing something and then actually doing it. Because a lot of times it's different than we imagine it to be. Well, it was different than I imagined it to be. But what I liked about it is it was a new nut to crack. A good challenge. Yeah, it was, I was so hungry for it that I was like really like trying to learn every aspect of it and how to, how to perfect it and understand my relationship to the camera and where my lighting was and my, and my partner and then what all the setups were and all of that. And that it was such a new world to dive into that uh, I, I ate it up. What brought you to LA then? Pilot season. I would come ah. out for pilot season uh, and go back and forth for a good long time. And then um, at a certain point, I just realized I had been spending more time on a plane back and forth to L.A. that it was time to go. All right. I got to move my wife and child uh, because I'm away from them too much. And it looks like L.A. is calling me more often than not. So it was time to move. OK. 
Okay. Had you been to LA before going out there for pilot season? As a well, we came out for Second City. Oh yeah, because you toured with them. Yeah, I think we did something at the Pasadena Playhouse, and I had been out to visit as a kid with my family, and I think when I was a, like a sophomore in college, I came and took a friend to prom. Nice. Uh, her, she was a few years behind me, and she moved. She moved to uh, California, and so while she was her senior year of high school, she's like, "Hey." I would love to come to prom. Would you take me to uh, my prom out here in LA? So I came out, I came out to LA and visited her. Right on. And went to her prom. Yeah, it was, it was cool. How many trips, or how long had you been in LA before you booked Buffy? Well, Buffy was was two thousand, mm-hmm. I think ish. Yeah, sounds about right. And I had done Angel prior to that, and and so here's the story: is yeah. I had been coming out to LA for pilot season from like '96 forward. Wow. Yeah, and um, and then I came out to find an apartment because I'm like, okay, I had booked a pilot with Jeremy Piven and uh, Jamie Jamie Gertz and Maria Patillo and Ari Gross. Uh, it didn't get picked up the series, but it was enough for me to go. Okay, it's time to move to LA, and. I came out to find an apartment, but while I was out here, my manager set up an audition for me and I booked it and it was for Angel. And so I'm like, I had to call my wife and say, I'm working. Why don't you get a U-Haul? I'll get the apartment. I'll get some Ikea furniture and I'll just pad the nest and you just bring my boy out. Yeah. Uh, And so uh, he just celebrated his 25th birthday two years ago. Happy birthday to him. Thank you. And so, yeah, I think booking Buffy was after booking Angel, and it was a few years after. How long were you in the makeup chair for that one? Because you had a whole yeah, had a whole deal. Too too long. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh yeah. No, I don't like it. Speaking of things that are different than you expected, probably like, oh, what very is this? So. Yeah, it was very intriguing and exciting. Like, oh, it's going to be a makeup job, and that was with Angel. And then they buried me in makeup for Angel, and I was like, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> But he did it. Let's get him a Buffy, too. <laughs> Doesn't mean I wouldn't do it again. It's just, uh, yeah, no, it's not my jam. How long after that, then? Because you worked on, did you work on Courage the Cowardly Dog as well? I did that, I think, when I was still in New York. Really? So you're just all over the place at the same time. That's really cool. Well, it depends on what year that was, but I think that was that was recorded before I left for L.A. How was that, doing, like, a cartoon? As somebody who wanted to be a cartoonist. It was fun because they wanted me to do Christopher Walken as the <laughs> robot. <laughs> Amazing. And so that, w- that was cool. It's the meshing of the two, the impressions and the cartoons. Indeed, indeed. What did you do on Along Came Polly? I was a security guard Amazing. talking to Ben Stiller. Are you said my IMDB open? Is that what you're doing? No, I do. I do like three weeks of research before I even ask. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, sir. Clearly. Oh, I'm deep. I'm deep, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. You have my resume memorized. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Also, it's my favorite Philip Seymour Hoffman role. He sharded. Um, he did. <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah, so I was a security guard. I'd literally pull up and I sort of yell out the window to Ben Stiller. And then I I, uh, I feel bad for him about his divorce, like sort of reinforcing that everybody knows yeah. about his divorce. <laughs> yeah. Was that in L.A. or was that in New York? That was in L.A. That was in L.A. That was okay. fun because I got to work with Ben. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I, I mean, we, I've never seen him since, but it was a fun experience. Yeah, I bet. And we had had m- mutual friends with like Adam McKay and whatnot. So there was stuff to talk about. It was really cool. And it was like I, one of my first bigger movie roles. Yeah. I, and actually, that wasn't a big role, but it was my, one of my first bigger movie yeah. ro- roles. Big project. That counts. Dude, I heard yeah. Josh Brolin say one time, it's better to be good in a great movie than great in a shitty movie. Yeah, yeah, you're right. He's not wrong. I love looking at people's lives and then learning like when things kind of rhyme with each other. Yeah. And you're talking about doing a Christopher Walken impression, Encourage the Cowardly Dog, but you also worked on The Rundown, which has Christopher Walken in it. <laughs> this Look is true. This. Look at this, this Todd. Yeah, it was... Uh, I also love that movie. <laughs> he, uh, I think I, I, I literally meant... I like had two lines. It was yeah. like, check, check quadrant four. Yep, in the in the control room. Yeah, that that'll be the one. It like someday if there's ever I'm fortunate enough that my career reaches a, a level where somebody does a retrospective, it'll be like, and look who we found <laughs> yeah. for one line in. Yeah, that was fun. The director Peter uh, Peter Berg. I remember him taking my phone and calling my agent and telling them that I showed up drunk. <laughs> 
and have he's a like, deck he's, up. Knock, he's knocking over light stands. It was very funny. <laughs> he's too tall. I had one line in that thing, and, and he was having fun just having a goof. With me. <laughs> that was fun. That's fun. Those are the kind of sets you want to work on. 100%. You know, because it's such high pressure. I never worked with The Rock. We just we just rode in Transpo together. That counts. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking back, you worked with a lot of really, really cool people and like really good roles with cool people because i'm thinking about like malcolm in the middle with the baby stuff yeah that was a fun I mean, one how much of that was a real baby and how, how much of it was a doll no babies were hurt in, yeah. in the filming <laughs> of, of malcolm in the middle uh i mean obviously so so much cinema trickery sure uh and then they'd fly in the real baby to like put into the carriage or to gently lay on the ground uh and then they would swap in a doll or camera tricks yeah. Got it. Uh, yeah. No real shuffleboarding of babies. No. A little disappointed. Just a little bit. Somebody just recently posted that scene. It's a good scene. It's it's a great sequence with the drool cups. It's a very yep. And he and he was <laughs> so much fun to work with. Cranston. He was yeah. Having the time of his life. Yeah. That's cool. It was really cool. I, I, I'm obviously biased now, but one of my favorite episodes because it's just the whole dads have to compete. Like, which baby can sit up the longest? Which one poops the so most? So much funny. So funny. Yeah, with the <laughs> with the Indiana Jones of the diapers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so funny. You also, you worked on a show, which I cannot find anywhere forever. It's one of my favorites. Still Standing. Oh, yeah. Dude, one of the funniest shows I've ever seen, and it's nowhere. It was a good one. It's like, so you can't, good. It's not streaming anywhere? Nowhere. You can't buy it on DVD? There's no, like, box sets or nothing? That was Jamie Gertz and Mark Addy, and yeah. yeah. That, was, that was really fun. One of those shows, whether it was Still Standing or War at Home, had that's where I met Rami Malek. Oh, he played the boyfriend of the daughter, and I don't know if it was still standing or wore at home. Th those those two, I conflate those two because they were kind of around the same time uh -huh. that I was shooting them, and they were very similar premises, which were like dopey dad and sharp mom, and yeah. Dude, my favorite episode of Still Standing is the kind of D&D &D one. There's a whole episode where uh, Mark Addy's son is like obsessed with the Owl of Prophecy card game, and I'm like, oh, this right, is right, right, the right, funniest right, right. show I've ever seen. Yeah. It was fun. I loved working on that show. And I love that character, Kyle Polsky. Yeah. Yeah, he's fun. And we got to we got to have uh we had we had uh go-kart toilet seats. <laughs> it was very fun. They were like go-karts, but they were made out of toilets. It was hilarious. Is it tougher to do like a, a drama versus like a comedy like that? Because they're different genres and I imagine it's similar medium, but gotta be a different style. They're different jobs because a, a, a half hour sitcom, it's a lot of kind of math to figure out the music of the dialogue so that the joke lands how it's supposed to land. Uh -huh. But an hour long drama is is a lot more. Well, it's, it's a smaller performance and it's sure a, you, you, you have a, a different relationship to the camera. Mm -hmm. um, I always joke that uh, the difference between drama and comedy is big reactions to insignificant things. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, and drama is little reactions to big things so it's like it's like what do you mean you forgot the birthday cake and then uh and then drama is like mr president a meteor is about to strike the earth so it's like <laughs> it's like if the stakes are huge in drama the smaller you act it's sure very funny, very funny. how long did it take you to figure that out oh it's just watching tv yeah <laughs> and going her birthday party is in a week. Don't forget. <laughs> and then it's like New York is on fire. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. How did how did they film your clones in Heroes? Uh, lots of setups. Really? They would literally lock off a frame, and then I would do I would do the line, and then I would go over here and do the extra part of the line. Then I would go there and do another part, and they would do a whole new setup. Oh. And I would do that line, and I'd do a whole new setup and do that line. So it was all editing. Or if it was the same frame, they do what is called a a uh, a master shot or a keyframe. Uh -huh. They would hold it and lock it down, and then I would do the line, step out of frame to clear it, go over here and say it, and then in editing, they just would layer it all on top of each other. Oh, did you at least get to do it chronologically, like line? By line by line? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. And we would build out from there. Yeah. I always wanted those kinds of things because 
there's different ways to do it. But then when you see it, you're like, what was that like on set that day? Because that's a lot of work and it's just you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, well, it was not just me. Uh, and that's the thing that I always thought was very strange was, uh, was or not strange. It was very like, oh, no. I would imagine the other actors would be like, oh, great. We have to shoot with Stashwick today because it's going to be <laughs> five times as many setups. Yeah. Yeah. So the day is that much longer because we have to shoot the one scene five different times just to cover all the character. Ooh. How was it playing a priest in the originals? Because you got a really good death scene in that one. It was uh, it was very holy. Uh, <laughs> it was fun. He was a very uncommon priest. I remember one of my favorite lines after they just like slaughtered like the council and they killed the mayor. And I'm like, how am I supposed to remake the mayor? Like <laughs> physically put him back together. Um, that was fun. It was fun. That was a great set and great actors. Daniel Gillies, Joseph Morgan, mm -hmm. Stevie Tonkin, just really wonderful people to work with. And I just love Michelle Paradise, yeah. actually a uh, showrunner of uh, Discovery. I met on I think the first day I was working on the originals. Dude. Yeah. And you got and that's a recurring. Did you do you find that recurring roles at this point are you more nervous because it's more work? Cuz you got to be excited cuz it's recurring, but it's also a lot more you're carrying on. I prefer it. Yeah. Uh I prefer recurring and series regular work cuz A, you know where your job is the next week. Ah, uh, fair. Uh, <laughs> and B, uh you probably get an arc. Sure. You know, being a villain of the week, it's like you either wind up shot or in handcuffs at the end of the episode and so there's no real arc to the character it's just like -ha -ha -ha. Uh oh i'm caught like and then credits <laughs> um but with with like a two to three episode arc or like in the originals it was an 11 episode arc on yeah you know it, it you get a chance to grow with the character and explore more do you attack the performance differently no 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 the process is the same. Yeah. The acting process is the same. Okay. I mean, you've played some pretty cool villains. The mask is, is pretty tops. Let's be honest. And as a Batman fan, like, yeah. what was that like? You know what? I, I It's another one of those moments like like on Star Trek Enterprise or on Picard where, where I had to stop and just sort of make sure that I felt very present. I was 3 o'clock in the morning, I think, shooting in the Bronx in a building, but my brain was like, nope. I'm in Gotham City. Yeah. And that felt really cool. Yeah. Like, I was just like, you know, getting a chance to embody and live within these worlds that I have loved since I was uh, able to imagine has been deeply satisfying. Yeah. How can it not? Yeah. How much rehearsal time did you get with the sword fight? Oh, actually, yeah, we did it. We did a bit of rehearsal with that sword fight. I think I did. I was brought in for... Uh, for a bit uh of that mostly it was my stuff there. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i love looking at actors in their careers and be like you got to fight superman you got to do this you got to tase jim gordon that's pretty cool see nothing wrong with that i got to i got to belittle jean-luc picard and i got to tase jim gordon two of the three these trifectas are, these, are, these are highlights <laughs> yeah. i don't know who the third is going to be but i can't wait to find out i know me neither so you talked about doing like day players versus doing recurring is it true that your role in 12 monkeys started out as like a tiny one and then just became this massive thing well I, you know that's the way it appeared to me okay because um, deacon's cool really cool you. what a role that's the way it appeared to me but uh you know i think i just heard terry metallis in an interview say they always had plans of growing the character of Deacon. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wasn't let in on that when I auditioned for the first couple episodes. Gotcha. It wasn't until shooting the season finale that he's like, no, we plan on making this character a series regular. And I was like, awesome, take me off the market, put a ring on it, let's do this. Yeah. And, he, <laughs> and he, lo and behold, he did. Yeah, I did. He says it was always part of the uh, the idea to grow this character within the franchise. I, that was not told to me when I auditioned. What a role. You want to talk about arcs. So much fun. From an acting standpoint, like, how do you let go of a role like that when you're done? Because it looks like you had so much fun with it. Yeah, you know, it, it ran its course. We, yeah. we I did it for four seasons. And so, and it ended so beautifully and completely and yeah. such a such a great story we told that uh yeah there was as as the kids say uh ate it up no crumbs yeah <laughs> and some of the coolest costumes in any show ever yeah well it's because we you know i i always loved how we treated time 
time frames as if they were countries that yeah. have their own cur currency and customs. Uh -huh. And so it, it's very much, uh, if you look at 12 monkeys, it's very much structured like Star Trek. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you have a captain of a ship on a bridge uh, sending crews out on away missions. And so yeah. it was very much, very much a Trek like show. Do you, when you look back on it, do you have like any, what's the favorite episodes that you think of in your head? Where like this one was either really, really fun to watch or really, really fun to work on or both. As an actor, I loved, uh, I loved to do the scene when I was covered in blood after I came back after being uh, beaten up by the foreman. Uh -huh. And I really loved all the stuff that I got to do in the, uh, in the prison in Titan where oh, I was yeah. acting against with, with my favorite actor, me. Oh no, <laughs> um, no, I was acting with, uh, I was acting with, uh, 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 my character. That's my father Yeah. and having, having this entire conversation and I had to play both sides of it. So that was a really, a unique challenge as an actor to, to do as a viewer, the groundhog day episode is pretty spectacular. Oh yeah. And then the two part season finale is just TV at its finest. And all the stuff we shot in Prague was great with the uh, with the masquerade ball and uh, and the medieval stuff. It was so much fun. Did you keep anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the, yeah? I have the bell. Oh. I have the bell. I have. Yeah. You have to. You have to. I have. Here, I'll take this off and show you. Yeah, let me see. Let me see. The, there's the witness. Oh, cool. And the word of the witness. And there's my uh, West 7 flag. Amazing. Deacon jacket and my deacon knife. My man. So yeah, I kept a few things. I yeah. Few things. <laughs> but yeah, I have the bell over there. Uh, Dude. A bunch of D and D dice in it. Oh. <laughs> Part, full circle. The the ultimate just that in a photo. Just Deacon's bell with dice. Well, interestingly, interestingly, uh, I had to get training for season three where I had to do all the prison stuff. Yeah. So that I could look emaciated and like I'd been in prison for six months. Sure. And the guy that trained me eventually became my DM and brought me back into the game. So really? Yeah. Dude. Yeah, it was cool. Look at this one hand washing the other. Uh, agreed. What was the blood that you were covered in? Was it sticky? It's like sterile syrup. It's really gross. Yeah, like you can't sit down anywhere. Otherwise, you'd no, you can't. And then and Terry <laughs> always had this habit of swelling my eyes shut. Oh, no. I read the script. It's like Deacon is so beaten, his eyes swollen shut. I'm like, okay, here we go. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, he loved doing that. It was a pastime. How long were you in the makeup for Draken? Because the veins looked really cool. Um, Draken, uh, it was maybe an hour and a half. Oh, they're fast. Yeah, maybe an hour and a half, two hours at the most. How much fun was that? Because it's it's cartoon, so it's it's big. It's kind of theatrical, but yeah. it looked like you had a real good time. I had a blast because I had gone from doing 12 Monkeys, which is always, as I joke, it was whispering in a basement. Sure. Uh, <laughs> that dramatic acting. Again, it's so funny because, you know, acting for a camera and a drama, you'll be at craft services and you're talking to everybody and then they say action. <laughs> <laughs> because your body mic on the camera's right here, so you can lean into this uh, like really dramatic kind of presentation um yeah but then then like one of the jobs not long after that was draken in kim possible which was huge <laughs> like i got to be i got to kind of lean into my sketch comedy clowning roots and uh that was fun really fun how long how long was that too do you remember maybe a month oh that's fun in vancouver yeah maybe a month in vancouver it was really fun how'd you get back into D D? what happened did he just invite you to a game or uh, i had seen okay so uh i had fallen out of D D because of the satanic panic back sure. in the day and That'll then happen. i walked away from all of my books and, and everything and then i was at an audition maybe 2013 and abraham ben ruby actor abraham ben ruby was um he was at an audition with me and he's like oh i was up late playing dungeons and dragons and i'm like you are what <laughs> i didn't realize that grown people were still playing dnd and he's like oh yeah me and matthew lillard and a bunch of people we've got an ongoing game i'm like that's crazy and i didn't know abraham well enough to insinuate myself into his group <laughs> yeah. but at least i went home that night and got on ebay and bought all my dnd books back Love and it. so just to have the new ones, but I still wasn't playing. And then, and then around 2015 ish, 2014, yeah, 2015, 2015, uh, I booked, well, uh, I, I went on Facebook 
and was like, that's it. I want to start playing D&D again. And then our, our mutual friend, Yuri, showed mm-hmm. up at my house uh, with the starter kit in hand and said, me Love too, it. happy birthday. And he gave me the starter kit. <laughs> he, was like, he was like, let's play d and I'm like, yes, let's. Uh, and so he wanted to play too. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And then I booked 12 monkeys and was gone for three years. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> so late 2017, early 2018, once I had finished 12 Monkeys, we jumped back in uh, and I started playing D&D again and have not really gone a month since. Dude. Yeah. it's It's got to be great. Like just awakening that sort of thing that's been dormant. It's, I love it so much. It's just, it's just the, the greatest way to gather with friends. Yeah. T- telling stories and having a drink and going on adventures it's the best really good acting practice too i found it's so much fun yeah it's so much fun i love it how long have you guys been doing your current campaign five years five years five years yeah and then i have two other ongoings that i that i do and i've been doing one of the ongoings for over a year and the other one just sort of started five years so we've had the same game going for five years yeah that's incredible how do you do experience do you do milestone uh, or milestone, do you do? Milestone, yeah, yeah, it's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. Do you? How do you? Did you plan out the campaign out the start, or did you kind of see what happens? How much has your party completely ruined your plans? With the five year game, I'm not the DM. I'm, I'm the player. Oh, really? Who DMs that one? David Nett. That was my trainer for Twelve Monkeys that got me back in the game. Dude. Yeah. And so your first big campaign back after all this time, what what class are you playing? I am a sorcerer ranger. That's tough. We are level 10. Level 10 at five years? So you you really know how to play a sorcerer then. I, 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 I'm i not too shabby. It's my favorite class, yeah. Really? How come? I like the magic within. I like uh, sorcery points. I like all of that stuff. I love the chaos table. I love all of it. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, I You know, I'm an old school because I started in 79. Like, I like a... You know, back in the day when we played D&D then, and I'm not, it's not better than now, it's just a different style of play where where nowadays with 5e, the characters are heroes. Right. And back when we played, they were survivors. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, so I think I, I, I like a much more stripped down, uh, like I like a Greyhawk. I like playing in Greyhawk. I like a colder, harsher, more stripped down where magic is a lot more rare. And everybody isn't, everybody doesn't have magic. You know, it's, it's, sure. it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a different experience. Uh huh. And my daughter is a DM. She is wholeheartedly into 5e with all of the things. And, and I just fan those flames and I'm so thrilled for her. Is there a class that you haven't played yet? I don't think I've ever played a druid. Okay. I've played a cleric, a paladin, a barbarian, a sorcerer, a bard. I've never played a straight up fighter either, except back in the day when we were fighter magic users. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have you played a wizard yet? I've never played a wizard. I'm very, I'm very limited in mine too. Cause I found something I really liked. And then I just, I really, I, I like Rangers. Yeah. 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 Rangers are my jam. I don't know why I just, you drill down on the Ranger. I love it. Rangers. And I like, I like fighters. Cause I like the simplicity. Yeah. I've always enjoyed like with constraints, trying to be as creative as possible, you know? Yeah. I'm on a, I'm on a three year campaign right now with an Eldritch Knight. Nice. Yeah, he's a he's a little a little grung who's very old. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> I like that. I like I like to mess with that. It's been it kind of fuels the creativity I find, and from an acting standpoint, hundred percent. You're working that muscle of like yes and yeah yeah, and then getting into character because like what would you do versus what the character would do? Indeed. It's just great. I love it. Best game in the world. And then you're doing the best jobs in the world, bringing it back with a Starfleet captain, dude, from your first day because. Obviously, you filmed a while ago. Yeah, uh, this time last year. Being a kid who loves Star Trek, yeah, to being a captain, to now seeing it, how 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 is that in your brain? Watching it now to be like it's it's real. It happened. Well, the part when it when it when it really felt real was we we did the premiere at the Chinese theater, and it really felt real when I walked into the lobby and I saw my uniform in a glass case on a mannequin. That was cool. That was like oh. Yeah, this this exists outside of me. Yeah, this is part of a legacy that I that I have you know put my thumbprint on, but uh, just one little thumbprint in the corner, but it's mine. Yeah, uh, but my characters 
costume uniform was in a glass case as part of this exhibit and i was like that's when it all felt very real it was cool yeah because before it's just a job in a room with a bunch of people with cool costumes and a set and everything and you're doing it but then you get to step back and see it with all the effects and all the music and all of the editing and you go oh oh they did my my little talking thing and they turned it into star trek because <laughs> it's star trek once it suddenly is scored and and you feel the you feel the event happening it's great it's like historic yeah you feel like you're a part of this history and forever you are part of something big it's cool so do you have any dreams left i got all the dreams yeah. uh, i'd like to play lobo yeah dude i'm team stashwick for lobo all right day. i want to play lobo I think that was the first thing I ever said to you. <laughs> exactly. Team Lobo. I would like to play Lobo. Uh, I'd like to do some kind of big fantasy thing. Yeah. R Rings of Power. Something, you know, I'd like to do that. Game of Thrones. I'd like to do a big fantasy thing. So those are two lofty goals. I like I'd it. Like to do a, I'd like to do a TV series where I get to, uh, I'd love to do a Supernatural Rockford Files. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Where I'm like kind of a private eye or something that, but like a like a like a Constantine type show. Yeah, like, that, like a know. serious Warehouse Thirteen. But a little more scrappy, a little more justified. Yeah, a more, yeah, a little more, a little more uh, gritty. A little more Stashwick, as it were. I I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. I can't help but not if I'm there. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, do you have any advice for like upcoming actors and people trying to do the things you're doing? Yeah, you know, stay warm, make stuff and watch stuff and be a fan, be a fan, enjoy, yeah. enjoy, celebrate storytelling because you got to love it because there's so much that's hard uh, in terms of something. I it's not coal mining, but it's it's a lot of emotional investment and it's a lot of rejection and it's all of those things so you got to love it and you got to be cool with a rejection and the, one of the best ways to be cool with rejection is to make stuff yourself that way nobody can reject you you get to call the shots you get to be the one making it so i was always doing improv always putting up shows that then i was always felt warm and i wasn't looking i wasn't looking to the industry to scratch my artist's itch oh i love that it's like because you're getting your fulfillment from the things that you're doing so yeah. there's less pressure in trying to yes. get the fulfillment from an external yes. source i don't i don't wait I, you know i never really waited around for somebody else to give me permission and that makes total sense why you are where you are now well, look at this so. look at this todd you're killing uh, it across the board <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and just like that dude we've been talking for an hour already oh you survived did it Look at we you. Did it. So before I release you back into the wild, I got to ask, yes. where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Talk to me. Todd Stashwick on Twitter, T Stashwick on Insta. And uh, if you want to look at my uh, geeky wares and nerdy paraphernalia, you can go to the nerdcircus.com where yeah. I sell stuff inspired by projects I've been in. I sell D and D stuff like dice towers and dice. I sell my tie glasses with, uh, with my nerd layer on them. And uh, I sell a cocktail book that I created with uh, a former Imagineer named Brandon Cleely, uh, which is a D&D &D inspired cocktail book called Mystic Libations. So uh, it's tiki drinks, uh, but with a D&D ish theme. Look at that, making your own stuff across the board. That's what gotta I'm talking it, about. Gotta make it, make your stuff. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. 
There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.